the stegosaurian dinosaurs and she would just hold forth in an informal way and we've gone um on to zoom which gives us the ability to reach out to a much wider audience which is great and we're very grateful to you people for um attending i just want to emphasize that the people who speak at cafe so i do so free of charge There's, they don't get any honorarium um, if it were at a live event we if I remember, we, we hold a, a sort of whip round and that pays for a drink or something. But they're doing it because they want to communicate. And I think, I hope they themselves get enjoyment out of it. But they're here because they want you to be able to hear what they um, have to say. And, and I'm very grateful that that happens. And that's what sustains us as the Cafe Sci um, movement. We've been going, I think, for about eight years now. Um, seven of those we were live. Uh, almost a complete year now that we have been online and we hope to continue that even when we um, when we go back to live events. Susie Maisman is, um, well, I asked her and she's, she's curator of non-avian dinosaurs and also crocodiles, which is kind of like the, the most cool job title I've got. It's not her real job title because she said she's a researcher, but I'm going to call her the curator of dinosaurs and crocodiles from the Natural History Museum and her particular interest is the stegosaurian dinosaurs and for those of you who are old enough um, I think there used to be a diplodocus or something in the in the big entrance hall of the um, Natural History Museum and now there's a stegosaur which is quite an impressive beast with those plates on its back and so she's going to talk to us about her passion for dinosaurs and particularly the stegosaurian dinosaurs. Before we start um, you should have a button labeled Q&A and if you have any questions to put to us click on that type your questions in I will view them and then I'll, I'll interrupt Susie you know I say at an appropriate moment but it usually turns out to be like an awkward butting in shouting over her type of thing um, to put the question to her some questions I might hold to the end if they're generic questions so I'll exercise some kind of editorial um, constraint on that okay are we ready Susie we are over to you then I'll pin your video Thank you, Chris. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm going to share my screen with you now. Um, and please do shout if you can't see. Um, hopefully you can all see that. Um, so thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you today um, about stegosaurian dinosaurs, which are um, uh, probably my kind of the group of dinosaurs that I've worked on the longest in my career. Um, as Chris said, I'm a dinosaur researcher at Natural History Museum, and I also look after the, uh, the dinosaur collection, which is one of the world's most diverse dinosaur collections. And I'm very happy to answer any questions you have kind of more generally about dinosaurs as well as about the topic of my talk today, of course, as well. Um, so anyway, um, the stegosaurs. Well, um, here they are. here's some of them. Um, in the top uh, left of the screen here, you'll probably recognize Stegosaurus. Um, now, Stegosaurus is uh, probably the most famous Stegosaur, but actually there are Stegosaurs from all over the world. Now, the Stegosaurs as a group are united by the possession of a series of um, plates and spines, this dermal armor that extends from the neck right to the end of the tail, um, which usually has some spikes on. And some of them also have big spines on their shoulders as well. Um, now, stegosaurs are known from all over the world. Um, in fact, the only continents where we don't have stegosaurs are uh, Austra Australia and Antarctica. Um, and you can see the red dots on this slide show where we found stegosaurs so far. Um, of course, there's stegosaurus from North America there. Um, but we also have uh, several stegosaurs from Europe. We have two from the UK. Um, one of which is from Swindon, which I always think is kind of bizarre that you have a stegosaur from Swindon, but there we go. And um, from particularly from Iberia, from Portugal and Spain, um, lots from China, um, several from Africa. I'm going to talk about one of those more uh, in a minute, which is our newest stegosaur. And there's some tantalizing discoveries from Argentina, uh, which suggests that stegosaurs were also present in South America as well. Now, this is a family tree of the stegosaurs, and you don't need to worry at all about the details um, on the left here, but the, the take home point is that the stegosaurs are the sister taxon. So this is, they're the closest related to this group of small armored tank-like dinosaurs called the uh, ankylosaurs. And these are uh, animals that are completely covered in armor. Um, some of them have clubs at the end of the tail, such as ankylosaurus, um, and uh, more, 
basal to them, so di diverging earlier in time, are a series of um, small armoured dinosaurs, some of which are two-legged and some are four-legged. And the picture at the top here shows probably the best known is Scolidosaurus, which is known from the Jurassic Coast in Dorset. Now, the stegosaurs um, were most diverse. We have, in... a, we have a very serious, deep question here um, on your previous slides. It might be a difficult one for you to answer. Are some of those names actually jokes? <laughs> I think it's a reference to like the gigantic Spinosaurus and the chunking Saurus. No, they, they, they are not jokes. Um, gigant Spinosaurus is actually from the, uh, the upper Jurassic, no, the middle Jurassic, the upper Jurassic of China. Um, and it is aptly named because actually, if I just go back to my first slide, um, giga, it's the one in the top, um, the top right here. And um, it does have some gigantic spines on its shoulder, as you can see uh, there. Um, so I don't know what it's doing in this, in this, this is a museum mount from the Zigong Dinosaur Museum. I don't know, is it laying, I don't know, is it laying eggs? I'm not sure. But anyway, that's the mount in the Zigong Dinosaur Museum uh, in Sichuan province in China. But yeah, no, it, it is aptly named for its gigantic spikes. <laughs> um, cool. Yeah. I, uh, I want to be in a, a science like that where you make up funny names. Right. <laughs> <laughs> there, Thank you. There are quite there are quite a few rules you have to follow when you're making up names for uh, for dinosaurs and or for any animal. And um, one of okay, the things we is have that a, we have a follow up here. Is T Rex the only dinosaur with it? This is someone who knows what they're talking about. Is T Rex the only dinosaur with its shoulder blades at the front of its chest? And if so, why are the shoulder blades in the front? Um, Dinosaurs have um, a, a, a scapulocoracoid. So this is your, the scapula, which is the shoulder blade, and then a coracoid, which joins in front of the, the chest. I'm miming, but you probably can't see me. Um, and it, and it, it had a, a, a collagenous uh, sternum. And I mean, crocodiles have this as well. Um, as far as I know, and I, I'm going to be honest here, uh, meat-eating dinosaurs are not my anatomical forte. Um, I work mainly on the herbivorous, or entirely on the herbivorous dinosaurs. Um, but to my knowledge, it has a sort of similar shoulder anatomy to the, other, the rest of the dinosaurs. Um, dinosaurs aren't like mammals, whereas if you can imagine like a big cat uh, running, if you, uh, if you can sort of picture a nature program that you've seen where big cats are running, you can see their scapula actually flexing as they run and the, the scapula contributes to the stride length. The dinosaurs didn't do that, they had, a, they had an immobile scapula, um, so their stride length was probably quite short. Cool, thank you. Um, so yeah, stegosaurs, back to stegosaurs. Um, so this, along the bottom here you can see time, so this is millions of years before present, and I've highlighted the Jurassic and the Cretaceous. Um, and the black line, and then up on the, the, the y-axis, you've got the number of genera. That's a number of different types of stegosaurs that we know. And you can see that the black line is the stegosaurs. And so you can see that stegosaurs reached their peak diversity at the end of the Jurassic period. Um, and they then declined quite rapidly in diversity and appeared to have gone extinct by the end of the early Cretaceous period. Now, um, in contrast, ankylosaurs seem to be very rare during the Jurassic, and they then increased in diversity as the stegosaurs decreased. And so there's been some suggestion that the, uh, that the, that the ankylosaurs actually outcompeted the stegosaurs, that they were maybe occupying similar ecological niches, um, and that the ankylosaurs sort of competitively replaced the stegosaurs. But um, we don't really have the evidence uh, to show this at the moment. I do have a PhD student who's investigating this right now. Um, so although stegosaurs are really, really iconic dinosaurs, I mean, every seven year old knows what a stegosaur is, uh, they're actually surprisingly rare as fossils. And, and part of that reason is because they're so old. You know, stegosaurs were already fossils by the time that T-Rex was alive. So a lot of their specimens are extremely fragmentary and known from very, very few bones. Um, this is a typical specimen of stegosaurus. Now, stegosaurus itself, is known from only uh, something like three to four complete skeletons or virtually complete skeletons. And this is one of them. Um, and as you can see, it's a bit of a mush. It's actually what's known as one of the roadkill specimens. And you can probably see why it looks like it's been run over by a bulldozer. So we can make out some details of the anatomy of uh, this animal. Um, I've labeled some features that I can spot. Um, but as you can see from the right of my diagram, there's a whole load of bony mush where all the bones are kind of squished together and we can't really tease them apart. And this has really hindered our understanding and 
of the anatomy of the stegosaurs and if we don't know what their anatomy was like we don't know you know really even what they look like it's actually quite difficult to make paleobiological inferences about how they lived their lives now that was true um, until we got this specimen here now this is the one that chris referred to earlier in his introduction this is sophie the stegosaurus sophie's its nickname and it was it uh, acquired by the natural history museum in um, about 2013 and Sophie is the world's most complete stegosaur. Um, it's on display in the Earth Galleries Hall of the Natural History Museum. It's a rather beautiful display, I think, and I hope that you all take the opportunity to go and see it when the museum is back open again. Um, and we have the real bones on display. So um, about 90% of the skeleton is complete. Um, the, I'm not very good at left and right, the left forelimb uh, is a, a mirror image of the right. It's reconstructed from the right because that wasn't recovered. Um, and a couple of the um, backbones were actually destroyed when the specimen was excavated, when it was discovered. Uh, but apart from that, it's, it's complete. Um, we have the skull that is on display is actually a replica skull. And we have the real skull um, in the collections behind the scenes. And, and a, a deep science question. Yeah. How much, how much does a dinosaur skeleton cost? Oh, well, it depends on the dinosaur. Um, I'm, I'm afraid I can't answer that for Sophie because that's not um, not common knowledge. Um, but uh, yeah, it depends what it depends. I mean, there was a specimen of I think it was a specimen of T-Rex that sold for something ludicrous, like 30 million dollars recently. Um, it's a specimen called Stan. Um, I mean, that was that was huge. You know, by far the most expensive dinosaur ever. Um, I think uh a big sauropod, so something like a Diplodocus or a, a Brachiosaurus or something, you're looking around, you know, a couple of million, something like that, a couple of million dollars. Um, so, yeah, I'm not at liberty to say, for Sophie. Um, but Okay, so we, yeah. we won't have one in the hallway then, right? Well, <laughs> I believe Leonardo DiCaprio does, but, yeah, I don't. Um, <laughs> it's, you know, what, what it is, is it, it's, it's far more money than uh, a museum's acquisition budget. So or our museum's acquisition budget. So our acquisition budget is uh, an order of magnitude smaller than that across our whole collection, um, not just dinosaurs, of course, across the whole of natural history. So museums are not able, you know, the, 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 the sale of the problem with the sale of dinosaur fossils and of all fossils is that it, it basically outprices museums um, from the market. And it means that we're unable to acquire specimens. And we were fortunate to acquire Sophie thanks to a large private donation um, that we received. And actually, uh, Sophie is um, the name of the donor's daughter. So that's why uh, it's called Sophie. Um, and we don't know whether oh, it's a, it's cool. a girl or a boy. So I'll just um, nip that one in the bud before it comes up. Um, but yeah, Sophie is, uh, this is, this is, this is Sophie's grave, if you like. This is the quarry where Sophie was found. Um, it's in Wyoming. And the rocks are about 150 million years old. Um, and it's in a deposited, uh, it was found in a series of rocks called the Morrison Formation, which were deposited by rivers in the floodplains um, in the Upper Jurassic period and are where all of your favourite dinosaurs are from. So Diplodocus, Apatosaurus, Brontosaurus, um, Allosaurus, and most of the ones that you could name when you were a kid um, come from these rocks. Um, and we were really lucky because when uh, the museum acquired Sophie, they actually gave us a year to have the specimen behind the scenes and work on it um, before we put it on display. So it was really, really fantastic. Um, and we actually had a postdoc work on it for an entire year as well. Um, and she uh, took over, I think over 20,000 individual photos of the specimen and the individual bones of the specimen. And from them was able to make a really, really beautiful um, digital model of the dinosaur for us. And that allows us to do some really cool computational stuff um, with it as well. So this was what it looked like when it was laid out behind the scenes um, before it went on display. And this is the digital model. And I've just highlighted a few things that we didn't know about stegosaurs before we had Sophie. So one of the questions was how many plates and spines are there on the backs of stegosaurs? No stegosaur um, at all had ever been found with a complete array of plates and, plates and spines. So we didn't even know how many were along their back. So we could confirm that for the first time. No stegosaur had ever been found with a complete backbone before. So we didn't know how long its tail was or how long its, its body was. Um, and an amazing thing about Sophie is that it has a complete but disarticulated skull. So um, the skull is made up of many, many, many bones. And um, in adult, many adult dinosaurs, um, but adult stegosaurs, this is true for as well, all of the bones fuse together. So you get a kind of big block. And 
it's a little bit difficult to see much in terms of the anatomy of the bones when they're all stuck together. So we have one or two really, really nice stegosaur stegosaurus skulls, um, but they're all fused together and it's difficult to get too much information from them. Um, Sophie is the only stegosaur that we have where we have a complete skull, but the bones are disarticulated. And I'll show you some of the cool stuff that we can do um, as a result of that in a bit. But once we had this, this fabulous skeleton and, and this um, uh, fabulous model, we wanted to learn as much as we could about stegosaurs and stegosaur paleobiology. So the first thing that we did was we wanted to work out how much Sophie weighed, what Sophie's body mass was. And this is interesting because body mass has a whole, you know, it's a really important attribute of organisms in terms of their lifestyle, you know, what, what they were doing um, from everything from their home range size um, to how many offspring they had and that kind of thing. So um, there's a couple of different ways to estimate body mass in extinct animals. Now you'll often see in the papers that, you know, a dinosaur weighed 70 tons or something like this. And actually those numbers, I mean, I don't know where people get them from. They're just, they're, they're virtually made up. And um, there's only two really robust ways to estimate body mass. Um, and we applied them both to Sophie. Now, the first one is, I'm going to refer to it as the linear bivariate method, and it's based on this graph. Now, um, I'm going to apologise in advance for showing a really tedious graph in my slides. It's not the only one. I, I will apologise for that more in the future as well. Um, but what this does, uh, what this graph shows is that if you get living animals and you measure the, the femur circumference, so that's um, the, the long bone of the back leg and the long bone of the front leg, and you measure the circumference of those two bones, um, and you add them together and you log them, then it scales linearly with the log of the body mass of that, those animals. Um, and you can see that linear relationship here. So theoretically, what we should be able to do is we should be able to measure the, the circumference of those two bones in our dinosaurs and simply read off body mass, which is fantastic because we don't even need a complete skeleton to be able to do it. That's really, really, really good. Now, the, a bit of a problem with this method, however, is that the largest reptile in this sample, dinosaurs are reptiles, remember, so the largest reptile in this sample is 170 kilos, it's an alligator, um, and that's substantially lower than the body mass of most um, of the dinosaurs that we're interested in. Um, and the largest animal in this data set is an elephant at six tons. And once again, we think that we have dinosaurs that are probably an order of magnitude larger than this in size. So there are some serious questions about whether we can really extrapolate this trend beyond our living data. Um, but we did it nonetheless. Um, and the second method that we can use is um, this one here, which I'm going to call the volumetric method. And this one, the disadvantage of this method is that it needs a complete skeleton, but happily for Sophie, we do have a complete skeleton. Um, so we take a digital model, um, as I've shown here in the bottom left, and um, we can shrink wrap it virtually in a convex hull. So basically wrap is, imagine that you kind of wrapped cling film around the skeleton, and you then measured the volume of each of the sort of body segments that you had shrink wrapped. Um, and you can apply a density, um, based on the densities of living tissue to these different body segments. And from that, of course, you can calculate mass. Um, and so we use both of these methods to look at Sophie's body mass. Um, and, and what we know from living animals is this, if we take our shrink wrap skeleton, that's a bit of an underestimate of like the fleshiness of normal animals. So what we can do is we can actually increase uh, that shrink wrap skeleton by the amount of fleshiness that we see in living animals. And it turns out that that fleshiness is about 21%. So if we take our convex hull and we increase it by 21%, that kind of gives us like an average fleshiness. And so we did that and we calculated the body mass of Sophie at one and a half tons, which is about the size of a white rhino. But of course, the great thing about doing things computationally is that we can do sensitivity analyses. We can play around and we can say, what if our assumptions are wrong? How much difference does that really matter? How much difference does it make to our calculations? So we kind of speculated that dinosaurs were way more fleshy than other living animals. Um, what if we increase that convex hull by 50%? Well, it comes out as 1.9 tons. So it doesn't make that much difference um, to Sophie's body mass. Now we also applied the linear bi bivariate method. And I, I'm just gonna show um, what we did here. So we, we increased, um, oh, we can't, using the linear bivariate method, we calculated a body mass of Sophie for 3.8 tons. So that's almost double our estimate for the linear bivariate method. And just for fun, we kind of increased our convex hulls to show what 3.8 tons would look like. 
Um, and this is what is shown here. I think you probably can agree with me that this is an unrealistically fleshy animal. I mean, its belly is hanging down by its knees. So um, we don't think that this is a realistic body mass, but we are a little bit concerned about what's going on here. Why do we have these two very discrepant um, estimates of body mass? Um, so another tedious graph here, along the bottom are all different ways that people have used in the past for investigating body mass and up the side is body mass. And um, what you can see in the blue box uh, is our estimate using the linear bivariate method for Sophie's body mass, playing around with our sensitivity analyses and incorporating our error bars. Um, and so you can see that that's between about one and a half and 2.3 tonnes, something like that, incorporating our error bars. Now, the where I've labelled fat Sophie, that's the um, linear bivariate method. Um, and the first issue you can see with this is it has massive, massive error bars on that method, which is a big problem for that method. But you can see also that the estimate and most of the error bar is well outside of our estimates, our preferred estimates. The ones at the end I've circled are um, where um, it's possible to take into account if the animal was not fully grown. Now, based on some work that was actually done on the skeleton before the Natural History Museum acquired it, we know that the skeleton, uh, that Sophie was still growing when it died. And the problem with the linear bivariate method, one of the many problems, is that it requires a, a, a fully adult individual. Um, and we know Sophie wasn't that. And some really clever person has come up with a way of modifying that method to account for the animal not being fully grown. So we were able to um, apply that. And that did in fact bring our body mass estimates back down into our preferred blue box. So we're pretty happy now that the body mass of Sophie was somewhere between kind of one and a half and 2.3 tons or something like that. So about the size of a white rhino, but of course the animal isn't fully grown. So stegosaurs probably got appreciably bigger than that. A controversy erupts and that is um, dinosaurs are too big to walk and therefore must have been floating animals but Sophie seems quite small by comparison with fast things like rhinos. Um, dinosaurs, dinosaurs weren't too big to walk. Um, they definitely were terrestrial animals, um, even the largest dinosaurs. I mean, we can do really quite sophisticated um, modeling using a variety of engineering techniques that show that uh, even the largest dinosaurs were capable of standing and, with, and holding their weight on land. Um, that's not controversial. Um, the idea that dinosaurs were aquatic or uh, you know these sort of big sauropods were living in swamps has was been disproven in the, in the early 80s and nobody considers that to be right today um i don't know i mean the, the, the body proportions are, are very different from living mammals so four limbs are much shorter because all these animals evolved from bipedal ancestors um so comparisons in, in absolute body mass with a rhino are reasonable in terms of total mass, but of course it was distributed very differently. Um, dinosaurs have a very, very large muscular tail, which um, along with other reptiles like alligators and crocodiles, for example, which um, along which the, the large muscles that uh, pull the legs back during locomotion um, ran. And of course, uh, things like rhinos and mammals don't have that. So they're very, very differently arranged in terms of their anatomy. Okay, and one more question. Um, on the note, this is from Cass, on the note of dinosaur age, do you use bone histology, counting the rings in the bone cross section to guess the age of the animal at death? Yeah, absolutely. So um, when bone is um, deposited, um, what you see is um, periods of fast growing bone, and then you have um, periods where there's, there's a slowdown or a cessation in growth. And that is considered to be um, potentially annual, but we don't really know. Um, and different bones can give us different signatures. But um, so, and also bone is resorbed from the inside. So we can't just simply read it off like tree rings. Um, we can't just count the number of like years that it's been around because it, some of the, the early ones have probably been obliterated. But what we can do is we can say whether the animal was still fast growing when it died or whether the outer edges of the bone actually show a cessation in growth and show that, that these, these annual rings are very, very, very closely spaced together and that there was very little growth going on at all. And that tells us that the animal was an adult. And what we see in Sophie is that there is no slowdown in growth. So it was, the animal was um, probably sexually mature, but not, hadn't slowed its growth yet. So it wasn't fully grown. I'm very sad that Sophie <laughs> didn't live out a full life. 
but most of the the, the the animals that you look at histologically aren't um that you know they, they seem to die well before growth stopped actually but, yeah. oh it's a sad <laughs> world thank you um so yeah another thing that we can do with these sorts of body mass modeling uh, methods is look at center of mass so center of mass is kind of the pivot point and um, in stegosaurs, we were able to model this using, um, we, we actually use a similar technique to the convex hulls method, or you can use the convex hulls method. Um, and what we showed here was to say for most four-legged dinosaurs, um, what you see is that the center of mass is um, slightly to the front of the foot, just above the toes or slightly forward of the hips. Um, I've shown it here in the black cross. This is my really bad drawing of a stegosaur. I've shown it here in the black cross that's actually right over the hips, which is actually surprisingly far back for the center of mass of a quadrupedal dinosaur. And it had previously been suggested that stegosaurs could actually rear up on their hind limbs and adopt what has been called the tripodal stance using their tails um, to balance. Uh, and potentially this would have allowed them to reach higher into trees to graze. And um, at least their body mass, our body mass or center of mass estimates don't um, contradict that. Um, it, it looks like they might have, it might have been possible for them to do that. So I mentioned this beautiful skull that Sophie has. Um, now, my colleagues at the University of uh, Birmingham were able to um, CT scan this skull. We CT, CT scanned it at the Tristan Museum, and then, and then um, my colleague Stefan Lautenschlager was able to reconstruct it and retro deform it. So if any of the bones are a bit squished, he was able to kind of mirror them based on the other side and, and make this really, really, really beautiful um, skull reconstruction. And um, we can then use a technique, an engineering technique called finite element analysis. Um, and this is a technique that engineers use to figure out whether bridges are strong enough for lorries to drive across them and stuff like that. Um, but what it does is it um, allows you to model, um, it allows you to strain the skull and, and model stress and stress dissipation through structures. And um, what the way that you do this is you take an object, in this case, the skull, and you break it down into a series of small cubes um, called finite elements. And the, you give those cubes the material properties of bone and each of those cubes is kind of joined by like a virtual spring. And it, once again, you can, you can give those virtual springs the properties of um, bone or of sutures between the bones and that sort of stuff. And then you can apply a force to different parts of the object. So in this case, my colleagues applied um, a force to the jaw to look at biting and they, they can apply it to several points. Now, stegosaurs, as you can probably see from these models, stegosaurs have really teeny tiny teeth. So the actual crown height of the tooth is only about five millimeters, despite the fact that a stegosaur has a skull probably more than a foot long. So they're really tiny and there's no real evidence that they were processing food in their mouths. So for lots of dinosaurs, we know that they were chewing. Um, we've actually got wear facets on the teeth, which show that we have teeth to teeth occlusion. The teeth are grinding past each other to grind up plant matter in the mouth. Now, stegosaurs don't seem to show that at all. So I had always kind of speculated that they were just gulping down some sort of really squidgy, soft plant food, um, something like pondweed or something like that. Um, and that they weren't, you know, that, that not much processing was going on. Um, but it turns out from this sort of modeling that um, actually stegosaur skulls perform very well under biting and that they were probably actually able to uh, chomp through things like small sticks and grass. And, well, the grass hadn't evolved yet, but things equivalent to the sort of strength of animals today that eat grass. So, um, so they probably had a bite force equivalent to a sheep or something like that, which was totally counter what I'd expected based on their teeth. And that's probably because they had a, um, a horny beak and lots of um, these herbivorous uh, bird hip dinosaurs had that kind of um, sort of beak like covering to their mouth. It's a little bit like a turtle's beak. Um, and we know that because of the um, evidence for lots and lots of blood vessels and blood supply around, around the nose. Um, so it seems likely that, that this bite force was, was kind of concentrated on this beak. Now, an aspect of um, dinosaurs, um, dinosaur paleobiology that I'm really interested in is locomotion, how do dinosaurs moved and walked. Um, and in order to understand more about this, we need to look at dinosaurs' closest living relatives, and they are the crocodiles and the birds. And what we can do, because we don't have any muscles preserved in the fossil record, we've only got the bones. Um, the bones do give us indicators of where the muscles attached. So there's muscle scars, which are often bony processes and, and marks on the bones. 
And what we can do is we can look at crocodiles and we can look at birds and we can see whether they have the same muscles in the same place, you know, starting in this, on the same bone and inserting on the same bone um, and look at where those scars are. And if a crocodile and a bird has a muscle that starts in the same place and finishes in the same place, then we can be really, really sure that, that dinosaurs had that same muscle in that same place. And we can then go to their bones and look for the scars of that muscle. Um, and so work on locomotion requires an understanding of um, these sorts of major locomotor muscles. Um, and so I spent quite a lot of time um, looking at locomotor muscles in stegosaurs. And um, I first did it in a, in a, a really qualitative way. Um, so what you've got here is um, hopefully you can see the front of the stegosaur and the back of the stegosaur and the drawing in the middle is, is the hip region. And I just highlighted some key muscles there. Um, and, and this sort of work compared it, I compared it to a whole load of other dinosaurs as well. Um, and this showed me that stegosaurs were standing. So along the bottom, I'm not much of a paleo artist, as you might have gathered by now. So uh, the, the image at the bottom is um, part A is if you imagine the, you were looking front on at the forelimbs of a stegosaur. And then part B is if you were looking at the hind limbs of a stegosaur front on. And then C is kind of the side view. So these animals were standing with their forelimbs quite crouched, with their elbows slightly out to the sides, almost like they're doing a press up, whereas their hind limbs are much more columnar. Um, and as I said earlier, you know, these animals, they're not like mammals. They're not, they didn't move in a way that, that I, don't, I think, would, I think they, would, they would look very weird to us if we saw them today, if we saw them walking. They probably had very, very short forelimb strides. Um, probably their speed of locomotion was strongly limited by their the length of their forelimb stride. Um, but we can actually test some of these ideas by looking at trackways in the fossil record. And we do actually have some trackways of stegosaurs, or we think of stegosaurs, in the fossil record. And this seems to support my ideas about how these animals were standing. But actually, we can go better than this, and we can do some quantitative work on um, uh, muscles as well. I've got a video here that I hope is going to play. Oh, it's good. So um, what you've got here, this is actually not a stegosaur hip. This is um, the hip of a small herbivorous dinosaur called Lizutosaurus. And I'm showing you this one because I don't have a video of my stegosaur, but we did the same thing for stegosaurs. And the front of the animal is to the right of the screen. I'll get that to play again. And what you can see that we've done here is we've mapped on all of the muscles. And we are able to measure um, the change in angle of the muscles over time and, and uh, with the stride um, that the animal would have taken. And of course, we've got a completely straight hind limb here, which is totally artificial, but it doesn't really matter because we're kind of interested in those muscles between the hip and the, and the upper leg. Um, and what we can do, that, that allows us to measure the moment arm of the muscle. And the moment arm is like the torque of the muscle, the ability of it to pull the leg forward and backwards. And so we can actually measure what the muscles were doing now we can only do this in a relative sense because um, force of muscles depends on a whole range of things, not just moment arm. It also depends on things like the, the cross-sectional area of the muscle, the fibre type, and things that we, we're really never going to know for dinosaurs. But what we can do is we can do it in a relative sense. And this, these are just a couple of really um, kind of complicated graphs, which are just showing um, me doing this in a whole range of different dinosaurs and comparing the sorts of moment arms of different muscles between these dinosaurs to help us gain some insights into how these animals were moving and, and their locomotor performance or their relative locomotor performance. And, and what we can tell from this um, sort of work is that stegosaurs were um, probably, um, well, I don't think they were running anywhere. I don't think they were running away from any Allosaurus on the Morrison floodplains, put it that way. Um, and I'm hoping, um, and I've got a PhD student working on this at the moment, that we're going to be able to go a little bit further than this. And um, this is a model of T-Rex, as you'll all recognise. And this is a model that was developed by my colleagues at the University of Manchester and Liverpool. And it's an evolutionary robotic model. So what they did was they um, built this model of T-Rex and they did exactly what we just did um, with plotting all the muscles onto the, the leg bones. And they also did the forelimbs for reasons that I don't really understand, but anyway. And, um, and then they um, put this into a learning algorithm, into a supercomputer, and they say, um, okay, walk, go ahead and walk. And the first time that the model does it, 
it's a bit jittery. I hope you can see it. The first time that the, that the model does this, it obviously it like bounces and falls over and spirals around. And, and then the second, and it learns it can't do that. So the second time it maybe hops and then it learns that that's not a stable gait. And what they do is that they give it a whole load of physical parameters, like you must obey gravity. And they um, can actually um, tell the model how much stress the bones can withstand based on living animals. And they can then use this to investigate what sort of stable gates animals might have achieved. Um, and in this case, this is a stable gate for T-Rex. Um, and you'll notice that this is a walking gait, so that um, it's both of its feet, are, or one of its feet are, is always in contact with the ground. It's not lifting both of its feet off at any one time, as it would do if it was running. So actually what the researchers found using this model was that T-Rex couldn't run. It would actually have literally physically broken its bones if it had tried to run. Its bones could not withstand the stress of running. So it walked quite fast. It walked about, um, uh, I think it was about 12 miles per hour, um, which is still faster than we can run. So my top tip, if you're ever being chased by T-Rex, is um, just make sure you're, you're faster than the slowest person in the room. Um, but we don't have to worry, it wouldn't have been able to chase down the speeding Jeep like it could have done in Jurassic Park or like it did in Jurassic Park. Anyway, uh, I digress, stegosaurs. Uh, so I hope that we'll be able to build something similar to this um, for stegosaurs, but this is worth this ongoing and we haven't done it yet. So probably the most common question that Sorry, I get. we've got a, we, we have a, a query come up here. Are you going to build them and if so, will you populate an island with them? <laughs> what, the evolutionary robotic ones? I think that'll probably be the best answer. I think we all know what happens. I mean, what, there's been like six Jurassic Park films now, right? And none of them ended well. No, so I didn't. think probably not. I think, I, think, I think probably not. I think, yeah, no. I think we've learned from that. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah, so the question that... Uh, I'm most often asked uh, when I tell people that I work on stegosaurs is what was the function of the plates and the spines along their backs? And um, it's actually quite a difficult one to answer because um, there's different ideas, but they're really quite difficult to test. Um, here's a selection of stegosaurs. Um, you might be able to see that they've all got slightly different shaped plates and spines. Um, and I think that's kind of interesting. Um, there's some, there's some ideas that have suggested that stegosaurs might have used their plates for thermoregulation. So this is to help them lose heat. Now, these animals we think were um, probably ectothermic, they're probably cold-blooded animals, um, but they're very large. And so they would have built up a lot of metabolic heat, just digesting food and moving around. And an issue for a very, very large-bodied, cold-blooded animal is actually how do you lose that metabolic heat? And so one idea has been that maybe they could flush blood into their plates and their plates actually help to increase the surface area to volume ratio of their body um, so that they could act as heat radiators. Um, that's kind of what I tried to show in the left image here, which is one I ripped off the internet. Um, but I, uh, whilst I think this is plausible, people have actually tried to test this um, using uh, kind of fluid dynamics and things like that. Um, and it, it, it has suggested that probably stegosaur plates did have some thermoregulatory function. That's not very surprising. We know that's true for also the scutes of things like crocodiles as well. Um, I'm not really convinced that that's why they evolved in the first place. Um, firstly, stegosaurus itself has these very, very, very large um, plates, which are shown in these images here. The other stegosaurs don't have such big plates um, and they're certainly not as big, wide and flat. They're much more spine-like actually. So I'm not really convinced that this is the reason that they evolved. Um, another idea that's often been put forward is that these were armor. These were, you know, they were, they were body armor. Um, I think there's a few problems with this. Um, obviously they're, they're restricted to the top of the body. So this leaving the sides of the body totally uh, exposed. Um, and also for Allosaurus, which I've shown here, um, fighting a stegosaur in the Denver Museum of Nature and Science, the, you know, Allosaurus had a bone crunching bite. I think biting through a stegosaur plate would have been like eating a pack of Doritos for a, uh, uh, an Allosaurus. I don't think it would have, would have offered a, a great deal of challenge. But again, we haven't tested that hypothesis. And that's something that I would love to do in the future using finite element analysis. I think the most compelling argument for stegosaur plates is that they were probably used for display. 
Um, and this could be, it could have been sexual display. So it could have been to recognize um, members of their own species. And um, all of the stegosaurs uh, have very, very slightly different shape plates. I've shown a, a kind of selection of them here. Um, but also we know that there were multiple different uh, genera of stegosaurs living alongside each other in the same ecosystems, or at least we find them in the same rocks. So they might have needed to make sure they were recognizing members of their own species to make sure they were mating with the right people. Um, it's possible that um, one sex, maybe the males had bigger plates than the females. We don't have the sample size to be able to tell that at the moment. We don't have a good sample size of complete plate arrays for any of our stegosaurs that we know in the fossil record. Um, or it could have just been that they were actually kind of a deterrent. So they just made the animal look bigger and more scary um, to kind of counteract predators. But that's my kind of preferred um, idea. But as I say, really, really difficult to test. Okay, so I told you, I guess, pretty much everything I know about uh, the paleobiology of stegosaurs. So I thought I'd talk about a little bit about some stegosaurs in particular and where we find them and, and some interesting things I think about them. Um, in the Morrison Formation, um, which I talked about a bit earlier, it's where Stegosaurus is from. It's this very, very famous suite of rocks um, deposited by rivers and on floodplains in the upper Jurassic of Western North America. We actually have two Stegosaurs. We have everybody's favorite Stegosaurus. And then we have another Stegosaur called Hesperosaurus. Now Stegosaurus is, is very well known. It's named for numerous remains, although most of them are fragmentary. Um, this nice skull down here um, at the bottom um, left is the other really good skull we have for Stegosaurus apart from Sophie's. Um, Hesperosaurus, on the other hand, is known from just at the moment a single individual in a public museum. Um, there are about five, four or five individuals in private museums um, or private collections, but um, we as uh, academic paleontologists don't work in private collections because the um, our science isn't replicatable if we, is that even a word? You know what I mean? We can't replicate our science if we, if we, um, do, if, 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 if the skeleton isn't publicly available, if, 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 a, if a scientist in a hundred years time can't go back and check my observations, then what I'm doing isn't science, is it? So, um, so we don't work on uh, specimens in public, in private collections. So at the moment, we don't have a lot of information about this dinosaur at all, except that we know its fossils um, are there. Um, as I say, these, these uh, dinosaurs are from the Morrison Formation, which is this beautiful um, rocks which outcrop in this absolutely fabulous part of the world. Um, right from um, Montana in the north, right the way down to New Mexico in the south. Um, and there are these lovely reds and purples and whites. Um, and as you can see, I really like these rocks and they're some of my favorite rocks. Um, I've shown the outcrop area here in blue. Um, so for those of you that know your North American geography, we've got basically the Canadian border is the top of the map. And almost the Mexican border is, is the southern part of the map there. So you can see Albuquerque and New Mexico right at the bottom there. So this is an incredibly large latitudinal area. It's actually 12 degrees of latitude, 1.2 million square kilometers we have of outcrop of these fabulous rocks in which we find these dinosaurs. And the Morrison Formation, the dinosaurs in the formation were first discovered when they were building the Union Pacific Railroad in the latter part of the uh, 20, uh, 19th century. Um, and uh, as a consequence of that, and also because these rocks host the US's largest uranium reserves, um, and were quarried for uranium until 1993, um, dinosaurs, dinosaur discoveries have basically continued unabated for 140 years in these rocks. So it's really well studied. Um, but the area particularly in, in Utah and Colorado is, is particularly well um, explored. And- Just one, one question on that. Um about bone wars i don't know what that yeah. is but bone wars is that the bone wars territory and what for me what was bone wars yeah exactly that's absolutely right so um when the um uh dinosaur fossils were first discovered in this area there were two leading paleontologists there was othniel charles marsh um who was oh i'm going to get their institutions wrong i think one of them was at yale um, and then there was Cope, um, Edward Drinker Cope. Um, I forget which institutions they were both at. Somebody can correct me. One, one was probably at the US National Museum, I forget. Yeah. But anyway, there were these two paleontologists working at two, um, uh, two different institutions and they became great competitors 
to try to recover these bones um, and name as many dinosaurs as possible from this area. And so all of these really, really famous names like Diplodocus and Stegosaurus and Brontosaurus were, were um, these dinosaurs were first described by either Mar Marsh or Pope. And they have actually caused a complete nightmare for the taxonomy of dinosaurs in this region, because quite often they were, they were just desperately trying to outdo each other to name as many dinosaurs as possible and like name the biggest dinosaur. And they sometimes they named the same dinosaur twice. So this happened with Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus. So um, I think it was Marsh named Brontosaurus. I might've got this the wrong way around. One of them named Brontosaurus, and then um, based on some remains that he had. And then one of them, um, so all of these people, you know, they didn't dig the bones up themselves. They had, they had lackeys to dig the bones up and then they got them shipped back to the East Coast to study them. And then Cope got this skeleton and, and he looked at it and he named it Apatosaurus. And um, actually, very shortly afterwards, it became clear that actually um, they were exactly the same dinosaur and that they'd just given this dinosaur two names. And when that happened, it's the one that was named first that gets priority. So um, actually, Apatosaurus was named first and then Brontosaurus. And so Brontosaurus was, was sort of smashed into Apatosaurus. And that's why Brontosaurus didn't exist. But recently, somebody has like, disentangled that and said, actually, Brontosaurus is a real thing and these dinosaurs are separate. So the debate continues, but it has caused a whole world of problems um, in uh, taxonomy of North American dinosaurs. I remember the Brontosaurus disappearing and I was very distraught. <laughs> well, it's come back, so you were right, Chris. It is back. Okay, we have Sorry a question. Back. Um, have, back. You, have you named dinosaur? I have. I've named uh, three, I think. Got another one coming. Um, I suspect that earns you at least three cool points. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm going to talk about one I named at the end. Um, yeah, I don't know. I've named four. Yeah. Uh, so far, all of mine have been stegosaurs. But I've got some others that are coming that aren't. So that's nice. Anyway, yeah. So anyway, Stegosaurus and Hesperosaurus in the Morrison Formation. So I think this is kind of interesting or kind of cool. Um, when we plot the raw data of where we see Stegosaurus and where we see Hesperosaurus, what we find is that Stegosaurus, Stegosaurus's range encompasses the brown kind of triangly shape I've got on here. Whereas Hesperosaurus's, Hesperosaurus's range is the blue triangle at the top. And this is only raw data, so it's possible that this is a sampling bias. The Morrison in Montana up there in the north is not very well explored for dinosaurs. So it's possible that Stegosaurus actually extended up there and we just haven't found their fossils there yet. However, in over 140 years of looking, no one's ever found a Hesperosaurus in the south of the Morrison Formation Basin. And I think this is really interesting because down in the south, there's a whole load of evidence from sedimentology, just about that, evidence from the rocks to also general uh, circulation models and climate modeling, that the, the south of the Morrison Formation was quite arid, whereas in the north, uh, it was much wetter. And uh, Stegosaurus is much larger than Hesperosaurus. And I think that this pattern that we're seeing is kind of suggestive that maybe these two dinosaurs were segregating along ecological lines. So that Hesperosaurus was occupying this wetter northern part of the Morrison Basin and Stegosaurus was occupying this southern, um, more arid part. And the reason I think that's particularly interesting is that today among extant mega herbivores, um, large size has actually been suggested to be an adaptation for aridity and for coping with aridity. Um, and Stegosaurus is by far the largest Stegosaur. And so I speculate wildly that maybe Stegosaurus acquired its large body size um, as an adaptation to aridity in the Southern Morrison Basin. Now this needs to be tested. We need to do a lot more work in the Northern Morrison Basin to check out um, that this isn't a sampling bias and that we, 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 are, we have just you know, fully explored it. Um, but I think it's an intriguing picture potentially. Okay, finally, um, so this is one, this is a stegosaur that I've named. This is um, the most recent stegosaur news. Um, last year, yeah, early 2020, we named this animal, which is Adreticulate bullhafer. It's from the Middle Atlas Mountains of Morocco. And it's actually North Africa's first stegosaur. And it is the oldest definitive stegosaur to date. Um, it's, uh, this is the site where it's found. You can see these lovely reds and greens. These rocks, they look rather like the Morrison Formation actually, de deposited by rivers and on floodplains. 
Um, and Adraticula at the moment is known from um, very, very few remains. This is about it. Um, it's a forelimb and some vertebrae. Um, and um, we don't know that much about it, but we know that it's old um, and we know that it's there. And that's exciting because North Africa has no other stegosaurs up to this point. We've got a few from much later in the south, but nothing in the north from this early middle Jurassic time. Um, I was hoping that I would be able to tell you all sorts of interesting things about this dinosaur because I had planned in 2020 to go back um, to this site to uh, start um, and set up a digging program with my colleagues at the University in Fez. Unfortunately, of course, we weren't able to travel. We were actually due, I was actually due to leave on the 23rd of March, which was when schools closed um, here. So um, that was sad. And I don't think I'm gonna get there this year either. Um, but I hope that we will have lots more interesting discoveries from this site in the future and we'll be able to learn lots more about this really early stegosaur. Um, OK, that's all I have for you. Thank you very much for listening. I'm really happy to answer any more questions that you have. Um, and I'll just uh, shout out to my colleagues um, who, who are involved with all of my stegosaur research on the left there. Thank you very much indeed. That was brilliant. Really enjoyed it. Yeah, we've got a number of questions if you're willing to take them. Of course. Uh, so I've stacked some of these up. I'll take them in some kind of logical order. Um, Sarah asks too, she says, how many dinosaurs are there left to discover, do you estimate? Oh, well, dinosaurs um, dominated terrestrial ecosystems, so land ecosystems, for 160 million years. So um, during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous periods, which is a period from about 200 million years ago to 66 million years ago, every animal larger than one meter in size on land was a dinosaur. So that's a vast, 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 incomprehensible amount of time that dinosaurs were the dominant terrestrial vertebrates. We have by no means discovered all of the dinosaurs that there are to discover, and I doubt we ever will. I have absolutely no idea um, how many are out there. The average species duration on Earth is about one million years, um, and they are around for 100 and, 170 million and uh, all, all continents. So, yeah, that we, we're not close to finding them all. <laughs> and she also asked how many have been discovered so far, which you just answered. <laughs> That's a really hard question as well. Um, it depends on who you ask. <laughs> There's a lot of debates about, you know, what constitutes a new species and what doesn't. So, um, yeah, actually, I don't know off the top of my head how many dinosaurs um, we have. I would guess um, low hundreds. OK. Um, Cass asks, has the attachment of the tail spikes to tail vertebrae of a stegosaurian ever been found? And if so, what type of connection was it? Soft tissue, bone fusion? It's, I, I believe that Cass must be someone who understands dinosaurs from the tone of that <laughs> question. <laughs> Um, yeah, we have actually a couple of really nice specimens, one from um, Stegosaurus and one from an African stegosaur called Pentrosaurus, where the, the end of the tail and the spikes are preserved in situ. And all of the dermal armour um, and the tail spikes included were actually embedded in the skin. So these are, that's why they're called it's dermal armour, it's skin armour, if you like. So these are like the scutes of crocodiles or something like that. They're actually um, formed in the skin. So they're not, there's no muscular attachment. And we can tell that by looking at the histology of the, the, uh, the bottom of the plates and the spikes. And um, yeah, there's no evidence of any sort of bony or muscular attachment at all. So they look like true scoots. Okay. Um, oh, Sarah says, thank you. That was fascinating. Nikki says, great graphics and graphs. And I've got some other questions stacked up here. Um, the, the, the role of engineering and robotics in dinosaur studies can you comment on that yeah i think it's it's really exciting and actually um it's it's a way that paleontology is really moving forward probably in the last sort of 10 to 15 years and it's really allowing us to move beyond um, kind of dusty skeletons and just understanding the bones themselves and the anatomy of these animals and actually making real testable you know people had always come up with hypotheses about how dinosaurs live, but it allows us to actually, you know, test robustly in a scientific way, um, or at least as scientific as we're ever gonna get, um, some of these hypotheses that have been put forward. So I think it's, it's really revolutionized the field, the advent of being able to do things like produce these beautiful 3D models, CT scanning, um, and applying these uh, computational engineering techniques and this sort of modeling has really, really is changing, well, not just dinosaur science, but all paleontology actually. 
And then a follow-up question to that. What background do you need to become a dinosaur expert? Well, you know, um, paleontology is a really, really multidisciplinary subject. Um, and people come at it from lots of different angles. So my background, I'm a, my first degree is as a geologist. I'm a geologist by training. Um, people also do come at it from biology and particularly zoology backgrounds. Um, but a lot of people will sort of specialize or have master's degrees in things like computation, uh, computer science or engineering. Um, and, you know, it, it becomes quite specialized as, as all sciences do. But what it means is that we tend to work together in quite multidisciplinary teams because nobody is an expert in everything. So I'm talking about these engineering techniques. You know, I've worked on the locomotive side of things, but I work with a biomechanicist. Um, he does the clever stuff. Um, and I just do what he tells me and press the buttons that he tells me, but I know about the animals. So he doesn't, he doesn't have the, I have the questions to test. Um, and, and between us, we come up with cool ways of testing them. Okay, thank you very much indeed. There's no further questions. That was absolutely brilliant. I think everybody enjoyed that very much. I'd like to thank Susie for talking to us. And again, I stress that people talk to Cafe Sci voluntarily because they uh, are happy to do so. So let's, let's, uh, we, we, we have a thing actually, I remember now where the raise hand button can be used to clap. And I think that's happening on there at the moment. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed, Susie. I'm just going to make a few remarks, but um, I'll spotlight myself for that. Yeah, OK. Well, thank you very much, everybody, for attending, um, because the audience to Cafe Sci makes it as much as we do who uh, put it on. And I'd like to thank James also, who put this online almost a year ago and has allowed us to continue with Cafe Scientific um, ever since. We've got a couple of events um, scheduled coming up um, soon on Thursday, the 25th of February, we've got uh, Jason Osborne talking on maps and maths and making friends. And Jason came to my attention because he publishes a, a graphic novel about mathematics and geometry. So I have no idea what that all means. And it was all beyond my um, ken, but it looked absolutely fascinating. So he's talking on the 25th of February. And then you've got me on the 11th of March talking about looking for cosmic rays in your beer. And the headline here says Chris Bohr explains his mad quest to see cosmic rays in beer bubbles. I'll um... <laughs> I'll leave you to discover that when we when we actually come to it. Uh, you can find us on cybercafe.science. So cybercafe is all one word and dot science is actually the domain name. And you can also find Cybercafe Scientific on Twitter. And Susanna herself is Tweetisaurus on Twitter. So if you look her up or under her name, you'll find her there. Uh, once again, thank you very much, Susanna, for coming to talk to us. We very much enjoyed that. Thank you to our audience for attending and I'm closing the meeting now.